Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of A Better Shoes Parade. We're really excited today to be having a candidate forum for both the candidates for school committee here in town, as well as the housing authority. Um, we'd love to have the, the can candidates for school committee um, introduce themselves. And we have a, a tendency in A Better Shoes Parade to do that in reverse alphabetical order. So Rajesh, if you could go first and um, tell us in under two minutes a little bit about yourself and why you're running for school committee. Wonderful. Thanks. Thanks one, uh, once again for coordinating this uh, effort and bringing all the candidates and the community, mem community members together. So I'm Rajesh Velikapuri. I'm running for school committee. I respectfully request your vote for one of the two seats on May 2nd, 2023. My wife and I moved to Switchbury in 2009, in part because of our excellent school systems and the vibrant community. So uh, professionally, I'm, an, I'm a business professional with skills in building, developing strategies and implementing both short-term and long-term growth initiatives. And I love to use those skills uh, in identifying the growth opportunities and focusing on continuous improvement. So for the past 17 years, I've been a bench scientist and also a business professional accelerating innovations in the therapeutic products that helps in uh, delivering better care, health, and well-being of all. So I'm running for school committee because uh, as a parent for two kids, of two kids, both grade one and grade two, I see the uh, I see where uh, I'm proud of our school systems where we stand, and I also see the opportunity for improvements. So with the with the ever changing academic um, public education landscape, especially, we need to bring 21st century competencies to our students through early career exposure and giving them opportunity to be successful. Both pandemic and Asabet Valley fallout press the importance of being nimble in our approach. So that thereby, so we can provide continuous opportunity funnel for our students to be successful. My experiences from Harvard Medical uh, Teaching Hospitals and biotech companies for in fostering collaborations and implementing strategic initiatives, growth initi initiatives, will be a unique skill set I'll bring to the table that will complement the current committee. And um, giving back to community empowers my sense of belonging for me. And, and I can make a big immediate impact drawing from both personal and professional experiences. Thank you. Thank you so much. Rachel, if you could give us an introduction. Hi, um, thank you to Sanam and Bridget um, and a better Shrewsbury for hosting us today and giving us this opportunity. Um, my name is Rachel Sharif Abor, um, and I am also running for one of the two open seats on the Shrewsbury School Committee. Um, supporting Shrewsbury and Shrewsbury Schools is a cause that I'm passionate about. My husband and I moved to Shrewsbury back in 2015. I actually grew up locally. I went through the Westboro Public Schools and I graduated um, from Westboro High in 2002. Um, the initial plan was to become a high school history teacher. So I went to UMass Amherst, earned my bachelor's um, from UMass in 2006. I still was continuing on with that, went to Boston College and earned my master's degree in history in 2008. Um, during that time, I was able to have a graduate internship with uh, the Boston City Council as a research and legislative aide. So I did a lot of work on policy and working with constituents and listening to what was going on and, and suggesting improvements. Um, from there, life completely made a turn and um, I work in healthcare. I've worked in healthcare since 2012. I'm a um, practice manager. So I do a lot with outpatient ambulatory clinics. It's the day-to-day -day management, it's um, doing departmental, managing departmental budgets, um, working with and negotiating physician contracts, everything that, that happens in a physician's office comes to me. Um, so that is what I've been doing um, in my free time. I also am an active volunteer in our community. Um, I am the current president of the BLPTO. Um, I have also been on both the Patton and Parker Road PTOs. Um, I got even more involved in 2021 when we were working together to um, get the override passed um, to help with the schools and municipal um, funding. Um, so I'm running because I care about Shrewsbury schools. I think we are so lucky that we have had um, really great school committee for a number of years, and we have really great district leadership 
as well. Um, and I believe that my background and my love for the schools and my ability to help um, and the fact that I have three little kids. I've got um, a fifth grader at Sherwood and I Thank have a all. third grader. Oh, I'm done. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very I much. I talked too much. No, that's okay. Thank you. We appreciate the enthusiasm from all of our, our candidates. Um, Sandra, if you'd like to give us an introduction. Sure, thank you. And thank you to Abeta Shushri for just giving us, all of us, the opportunity to be more public about why we're running for the school committee. I know I personally believe that public education is the great equalizer, and I hope that my work on the committee has really um, been doing that for years. And I'm running because I bring historical and um, institutional knowledge, work ethic, and community partnerships, as well as the educational and work experience that I think is really needed to be a, su a successful and strong committee member. Um, my contributions to the committee, especially during the lean financial times that we experienced, really helped to ensure that we kept strong financial uh, position and that we also kept our educational uh, system strong. I grew up in Worcester. I graduated from Worcester Public Schools. I have an MBA and I have a BS in management. I'm a senior dispute resolution consultant for Unum Insurance. And my work involves uh, litigation consulting, mediation, negotiations, and I do a lot of financial analysis. I've been a town meeting member since 2003, and I've also been a board member of the Shrewsbury Education Foundation, which is a nonprofit board, and we raise money to provide grant funding for educational experiences in the district that are not able to be funded through the appropriated budget. My husband and I have lived in town for 31 years. We have two children who graduated from Shrewsbury Public Schools, very well prepared for life afterwards for college and graduate school, and they're doing well as young adults. Um, I've been involved as a parent volunteer, and I really became interested once the financial perspective of the, the town was kind of getting to a point where we were cutting. And in 2007, we actually formed a parent group called Citizens for a Better Shrewsbury. And we were the first uh, public group that was formed to get information to families, not just parents in school, but other community members about education. And we pushed for the um, first 2007 uh, override that was not successful, but we stayed strong and we were able to get some passed. So at this point, I'm running not because I feel it's a position or a title. Um, I believe very strongly that it is the work that I do, and I hope people see that my work has added to the benefit of education throughout the community. But there's more work, work to be done, you know that, and I feel confident that I have the knowledge and experience to keep doing that, so thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we're also going to introduce the candidates for um, housing authority. So if Kathy, if you'd like to introduce yourself, that would be great. Everybody has the right to safe, sanitary, and affordable housing. And that's why I ran for housing authority in 2018. And it's why I'm seeking re-election in 2023 on May 2nd. My name is Kathy McSweeney. I am a third generation Shrewsbury resident. My family moved to Shrewsbury in 1916. That was before the last pandemic. Um, I graduated from Shrewsbury High in 1984. My husband and I both graduated. I uh, went on to Northeastern, had jobs in Boston, moved to Chicago, and then when it was time to start our family, we moved back here in 1997. I began selling residential real estate after a year in high tech. I, I started selling real estate in uh, 1998, and I, as a realtor, I was the president of the 2022 the Realtor Association of Central Mass. That's a 2,000-plus member trade association. Uh, here locally. I also serve on the NAR Diversity Committee and also the NAR, uh, MAR, which is the Massachusetts, NAR is National Association of Realtors, and MAR is the Massachusetts Association of Realtors Diversity Committee, as well as their Government Affairs Committee. I'm also a Rotarian. I was president of the Shrewsbury Rotary in the 2018-2019 calendar year, and then will serve as co-chair and co-president in 23-24. I am a town meeting member from Precinct 8 and also a proud voter. Um, registered to vote in 1984 in Shrewsbury Town Hall, day after I turned 18. And I'm um, proud to say that um, I want to continue my work on the Housing Authority. I think we've accomplished a lot over the last five years, but there's still a lot more work to be done. So appreciate the opportunity here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And we just want to acknowledge um, Adnan Sharma, who's also running for the position, who is not able to be with us today at the forum. So we wanted to start off with a couple of questions for you um, to just kind of get the conversation flowing. 
Um, anyone who's been a part of an A Better Shrewsbury Forum or in the group knows that we're a pretty informal bunch. Um, so we really want to take this opportunity to kind of understand you, understand your perspectives, and then we'll open it up to the floor for people in the group to ask you questions um, that were not pre-submitted or pre-formulated for this. Um, okay, so the first question is actually for the school committee candidates, and it's, can you identify a specific inequity in our schools, explain why you think it is inequitable, and talk about how you would address it as a school committee member? And anyone can jump in first. Sure. Okay, I'll jump in if that's okay. <laughs> I think for me, one of the biggest inequities that we're facing right now is the space needs at Chushby High School. And because the, of the fact we don't have enough space for the students today, when we talk about vocational and technical training, that's just added on to this inequity across the board. Even if we had total you know, funding, we could do anything we wanted. We don't have space to add any additional courses, academic courses, space for special needs students in certain areas that they need to have a, a safe space to have experiences. We do not have enough space for vocational and technical and career planning. So that is a huge inequity that we're facing. So we can't add anything without space. So uh, how do we do that? We are looking at a possible expansion of the high school as part of our space needs study that we just completed. We are also looking into career and technical training that can be done within the classroom that we have now and adding some experiences in that pathway as well as, well as outside. But that is a huge area that we're dealing with right now. I'll jump, I'll jump into that. Um, I was also going to say that um, the not having the space at the high school um, and the, um, I'll touch upon a question that was asked a little bit earlier about um, like comparing Shrewsbury to other towns. We have a fantastic school system um, and we have had things in the past, you know, a lot of it having to do with the financial resources that we had to make really tough cuts in the past. Um, we weren't able to add certain courses to our schools um, because we don't have space in the schools. We also can't expand upon the, the curriculum. So when you look at places like Shrewsbury compared to, and I'm just going to use Westboro because that's just where I grew up, um, there's a lot more offerings, but there was more, they have more ability to do things. So up at the high school, you know, the fact that we're, we're in a not a small school, but it's just not meeting our needs right now. If we're able to expand that, we're going to be able to expand not only the curriculum of, um, you know, the traditional high school, but again, adding on the vocational element that we're not going to necessarily be able to, to add the, um, the labs and whatnot that vocational schools traditionally have, but we can put in a computer lab to help with, um, you know, uh, the computer um, pieces of it. Um, but also to looking at the the elementary schools having equity across the board there my kids are lucky that they are at Beal, um, and we have a beautiful school that is spacious and we have room to expand um, but there are some other elementary schools that we're going to need to address at some point Coolidge is going to be coming down the pipeline at some point Patton very small community schools um, but we're probably going to see areas of growth. Um, and there are things that we probably can't necessarily do at smaller schools like Bullish and Patton that we might be able to do at Beale. I, uh, <clears throat> um, I totally echo the sentiments raised by the can by my fellow candidates. So, uh, so but for me, the biggest thing is the vocational um, uh, opportunity that's been missed with the Asabet Valley, Valley fallout. It's 130 students that used to go to the Asabet Valley. Now they their career paths are like a sort of a, in limbo. Uh, although we do have the opportunity to bridge these um, be with the like, multiple um, uh, countermeasures, mitigating measures, both uh, uh, temporary and permanent. So as, as a couple of members mentioned early on, countermeasures, Temporary ones are like bringing, working closely with the local community colleges so that we have those education needs will fulfilled and long-term permanent, um, permanent measures will be like working with the, with the state and, uh, and the DESI especially to, to make sure that we got an equal seat at the table, but the, 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 the also participating in the newly 
um, uh, initiated program by the CLA, innovations pathways program and all those things. So there are institutions which are already adopting these innovation pathways. We can work with them so to send our kids there for now, but we can also see how we can collaborate and expand on that. So the, the second thing, as a, the, the other thing, equality, equality right? I, I totally agree on that. Space constraints, especially high school, but it's not the only one, right? So we that's one of the, my priority pillars at the, at the, in those circles. So it's like a, looking at the holistic, holistically on the space needs across the school systems and building up a roadmap on, on how to address these, right? Definitely college is one of, uh, college is one of the such schools that needs different attention. And also other elementary schools are getting space constraints as we as we go into in the future years. So we need to have that you know, be, uh, like a, a, a robust roadmap on when can we, how to stretch the ma the dollars to the max, but also provide that facilities that the, our kids really deserve and then excel in the academically in, the, in their academics. So that's that's a balance that we need to do. And then we, that the balance we have to continue to do. And that's where our priorities will be. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, um, this next question also for the school committee is what specific ideas do you have for recruiting and maintaining a diverse teaching and leadership team here in Shrewsbury? This area is of specific concern to members of A Better Shrewsbury, as this is something that we've been um, sort of pushing for in the community. What are some of your ideas for, for getting that done here in town? Assuming that it's something that you think needs to be done. Sure, I'll go first if that's okay. Uh, I think we've made inroads uh, in the, the recruitment, particularly of getting a much more diverse population to educate our students. We're not using, you know, we're using School Spring, which is one of the hiring areas, but we're also looking in other areas, local colleges, historically black colleges, looking for people to come to Shrewsbury because they want to be here and educate students, but we also want them, as you said, Bridget, we want to retain them. And I think to me, that's even more important. We want to make sure that we get the right people and that we train them and that they want to stay and help our students over the years to be educated so that everybody feels they have someone to go to, someone that looks like them, someone that is more attuned to maybe what they're having at home. And we are making strides, but we again have a long way, we have a long way to go. And I think that happens in a lot of industries. It's not just germane to school districts. I know the company I work for, we're trying to do better at making sure we're doing better in our hiring processes. But um, it's it's a roadmap again, and we're doing better, but we uh, still have a ways to go. Um, if, I, if I may. Yeah, so uh, as, as, um, so well said, uh, Sandra. So um, DEI um, is a is not an action; it's a journey. So we had a so being a part of the DEI task force, I pride myself in in looking into the details on where the town stands and then what are the opportunity, what are the ways to improve the participation of the of the diverse groups, opportunities. So having a table, uh, having a seat at the table is not the only thing. You need to have that exposure, ability to grow, ability to identify the opportunity, and also move ahead in your career path is also very crucial. So that's where I feel very strongly on. I think one of the pro proposals I think we discussed during the DI task force was uh, the school uh, teaching staff should represent uh, the uh, the school uh, student body. So one of such, such activities, but but the pool of candidates will always be a limiting factor. But also giving that opportunity for the for the teachers who are willing to get the uh, get into that um, profession, giving them opportunity, giving them all the uh, all the skills they need to develop, uh, providing the support for getting that um, certifications, degree, master's degree, or a bachelor's degree, whatever. It is, so that we have a very good talent pool of candidates that to to be filled, and also and also grow it's not just hire them and then say okay we have the numbers but it's not like we, we then we need also have the opportunity for them to grow within the organization so that's where the priority should be and i think i definitely agree um the we are heading in the right direction making especially with the town adopting a dei committee itself is a it's a good, a good starting step um based on the recommendations from the task force but we that's a, as i said it's a journey we have to keep this uh, keep momentum, keep going, and also support all 
to support all those efforts to make this a more successful and diverse, diverse town and school system in itself. Thank you. Um, I agree that we have done, or the school system has done a great job at looking at how do we improve diversity in the schools with our teaching staff, uh, with our paraprofessionals. There have been changes, having been involved in a lot of that, not a lot, but on hiring committees. There's been a change in the last few hiring committees that I've been on to a hiring committee from a couple of years ago. Um, they've implemented, you know, something called the you know, circle of trust, where you really have to look inward at yourself as an interviewer and say, do I have bias or which, you know, when you look at who you know, they'll ask in, in, in the circle of trust, like, you know, think of people who who live on your street. Think of somebody, think of three people that have, you know, what their religion is. And you, you tend to be around the same people. So introducing that in the hiring process makes you take a look and stop and, and think about how you're approaching interviews. But I think also the school's done a great job at looking at the job postings that they have and seeing do teachers, do candidates for other positions need to have some of the requirements that were on there? In some cases, they don't. In some cases, they didn't need as much experience. Um, and I think that that's important, too, because then that opens up the scope of, like, who you're going after. Um, but also, too, it's important to make sure that we are able to have um, – adults in the buildings that are teaching the kids that they look like the kids they share the same you know cultures they say, have the same holidays they have the same practices um because another thing that is important to the schools is making sure that there are role models for our children so that they feel safe so they feel that they can go to somebody whether it has to do with bullying or um, just making a connection we want to make sure that there are staff in the building that there may be students that just feel like i would i would rather go to this adult because i have a connection that they might understand me a little bit better um, so i think that there's still work to do i do think that there's been a lot of progress so far um, and I think when you walk into the buildings, you can see that as well. Thank you. Um, and now I'd love to ask a question of the Housing Authority candidate, or yeah, candidate who's <laughs> on the call. Um, what are the most significant barriers that members of vulnerable populations face looking for housing in Shrewsbury, and how can that be addressed systemically here in town? I think that is more. Um, almost like I'm putting my real estate hat on rather than my uh, housing authority hat when it comes to that. The housing authorities run a little bit differently. Um, we have lists. So um, we have public housing, which is run by DHCD, and then we have pub uh, public housing, which is run by HUD. So they manage, you know, DHCD manages the list. So there's really not anything, you know, it's if you're next on the list, um, then you get into housing. So it really doesn't have anything um, impact our ho public housing. Um, there's just, you know, elderly and young and disabled. From a more of a sort of a town issue, I think it's affordability. And I think there's just not enough affordable housing in town. And so, and we use a term, not just affordable, but attainable housing. So I think that really is a bigger problem. And some of the things that were talked about in the first hour about how, you know, changing our zoning, there is something called the MBTA communities, which is a bill that's um, in progress that which would make um, by statute zoning that would accommodate multifamily housing. And I think that would make things more attainable. So I'm, I'm not sure if that answers your question, but. Yeah, no, that was great. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, if you could create or change a current housing law restriction, what would you change and why? Um, a housing law restriction, I think at, at the Housing Authority, that's exactly what the commissioners do, is they set policy. We manage the budget they, as the executive director reports into us, and then we, you know, we set policy. So the different rules that are in place, um, and the rules are set in place really for the, you know, with our, our residents' best interest in mind. Um, I think, I, and again, I'm putting my real estate hat back on because we don't, there's really not a, a rule that I think that we could change that would make housing more available. Perhaps the one exception to that would be um, CHAMP, which is how DHCD does their housing. So CHAMP is the Commonwealth Housing Application for Massachusetts program. So um, during the past five years, when I first came on the board, um, we managed our list for the state the, the state owned housing as well as the towers. Now we don't, now it all goes through the Commonwealth. So every time something opens up, 
in one of our um, residential units. Our staff is required to pull the next 25 names on the list and then mail them applications. They complete their application and then you know someone is picked for that. So I, what I don't like about that is we've taken out the ability to give residents uh, current residents of Shrewsbury priority. When I first started, um, it was veterans went to the top of the list and then Shrewsbury residents were right behind us. We had a vacancy. We did our best to get a Shrewsbury resident so people could stay in the town in which they'd raise their families and live for years. That's not a possibility anymore. The state took this over probably three or four years ago. So I think if I could change that, I tried working with Representative Kane. She tried to, to make some inroads there, but I think that would be the biggest thing to make it so that people had priority if they're already from Shrewsbury. Thank you. Yeah, I hope that we'll get some more questions about the, the application process as we open it up. Um, I would like now to open it up to questions from um, participants. I know that Ashley had a question that she wanted to ask first, but then if you could please raise your hand and Sonam or I will acknowledge you um, if you have a question after Ashley. Ashley, are you there? Yeah. Thanks, sir. Um, so my question is about uh, behavior management in the schools, which is a really widespread challenge. Shrewsbury and beyond always comes up on all our surveys, thought exchanges, et cetera. Um, we have teachers and staff reporting frustration around classroom disruptions, capacity for management of behaviors, families of students without behaviors, um, reporting concerns about their student receiving less attention, being subject to undeserved consequences, things of that nature. Uh, on the other hand, families that include students who struggle with what gets labeled as behavior as a direct result of their disability have a lot of concerns about the way this is handled in our schools and often um, the very significant negative impact that this has on their already vulnerable students' mental health. Um, yet the proposed strategic plan and kind of everything that comes from the district seems to suggest that we just sort of do an increased amount of the same behaviorist type of approach we've been doing rather than looking at other methods. Uh, so I would love to hear anybody's thoughts on that and how you see us moving forward. I'll start if that's okay. Yeah. I think it's a very delicate balance for, for families and for teachers, staff, and administration. And I know I have a niece with special needs and some of hers is behavioral issues. So I think it's one of those where we have to make sure that the student all students in the classroom are safe and all of their needs are being taken care of and very delicate balance. And that is why we do have content experts who are the professionals in working with families and teachers on the best methods for that. I don't have a answer for that myself because again, it's I think a student by student issue, but we, we definitely are looking to make sure that all student needs are taken care of, whether it be in just the educational piece, or it's also with any um, behaviors or discipline, and it could be for anything because every student's rights are important. So for me, it's a it's a parental right to speak to the teacher and speak to the staff as well as the administration if there is a concern that needs to be addressed, and it will be worked out in the best interest of everybody involved, but that is a very difficult area to deal with. And, and I feel for any families who have to deal with something like that. Do you wanna go Raj or you want me to go? Go ahead, Digital. Okay. Um, I agree, um, it's, it's a really slippery slope. Um, I, so I have personally, I have a student um, who, although does not have behavioral issues, um, we are going through special education and evaluating her um, because she is, you know, ADHD and she learns differently. Um, and sometimes, you know, with what she does in a classroom, she is a learner where she has, she stands up when she, she writes. And um, although she's not disrupting other people, that could be a disruption to someone that she's taking a, a test across the way from. Um, so I, as a parent, feel comfortable going and talking to her teachers. I have felt co comfortable going and talking to the schools, um, the principals, um, special education. Um, and, you know, me as the parent of a child that 
does have to have some kind of accommodations. Um, I also, it's, it's tricky as a parent that I also have children that don't need those accommodations. And there are, there have been times that they've been in classrooms with um, other students where it's been really difficult for them to learn. Um, so it's, it's a tricky thing to do and being able to give the support to the students that need that help with the students that need a different kind of help, um, but also responding to the teachers too, because that's really difficult to manage classrooms of 20, 21, 22 kids that are just across the spectrum of their learning where some need more help and some need other help. Um, and then you've got, you know, just normal behaviors in there. Um, so I think that this is something in the strategic plan that it's definitely something to be worked on. I think it's very important because I think that we're seeing more and more classrooms come out where there are kids with varying needs and we need to be able to address um, what's going on in each classroom. Wonderful. <clears throat> so yeah, th thanks for that. So um, I, I do agree. So so behavior wise, it's it's a it's a it's a it's a double edged sword to so to speak. So some some definitely need attention, um, definitely, and then they also have the right to learn in uh, sitting in the class. And so as a parent, I have we first hand experience. Um, there's there's without one of the kids that she was not able to understand why that kid. It needs to grabs the whole class attention. So we we work with the teacher in making sure the rest of the class understands the students' need, and also we we at home uh, trained or sort of gave her what's the circumstances, what the, what are different types of uh, student needs that that may not be your uh, rest of the class don't need. So as a parent, we also. Um, uh, sort of work with our kids and also we, uh, uh, give kudos to the teachers that they work um, uh, through day in and day out, especially at the teachers and paraprofessionals, um, admin, admin staff and everyone um, to make sure that everyone needs are met in school in a more diligent and respectful way. So, but uh, this, this is seems to be one of the incidents keeps coming back at several levels uh, um, and especially when uh, post pandemic but we have to really be nimble to see how to um, how this is evolving and and, and address this in a more in a meaningful way. Thank you. Thank you. So we wanted to to circle back to a question that was raised earlier um, that we were asked to present, um, and that is uh, how we should proceed with the use of iPads in the classroom in Shrewsbury schools and in their in the homes and whether or not this is having a positive or negative influence on the social skills and development of our students and whether or not we need to focus more on computer training and new technology emerging technologies as opposed to relying on the ipads um, and i will just say as a parent the ipads have caused a lot of good things in our home but they they can sometimes cause a lot of frustration as well um, so i'm interested in hearing the thoughts of the candidates on that matter. Can I start? Um, so with everything, there's good, there's good and bad, right? We all have fights with the iPads because they're doing things that they're not supposed to be doing. Um, but the, one of the good things that I think with the iPads are is that it gives equity um, to our students. So you have some students that use the iPads at home, but they're used as a tool in the classroom where um, I think some people think it's just keeping the kids busy while lesson plans are happening, but that's not necessarily the case. There are, um, there are apps on the iPad that are used because there may be some kids that go home. I'm like, I'm thinking in terms of reading, right? On some of the, I'm looking at elementary school, they have access to Sora and Raz Kids on their iPads that they can log in, they can read a book and um, they can read it in English. They can read it, read it in their home language. And there may be kids that when they go home, they don't have internet access. So being able to access that in the classroom is really important because it's keeping them, um, Current with students that might be able to go home and read a book from their own library at night. Um, it's also gives them access to, you know, our, I'm thinking of our non, non, their English is not their first language that we have access to um, systems like ST math, which is not 
language based. It's just based off of if anybody has younger kids that use ST math, it's puzzle based. So they have to be creative and they have to be analytical and figure out, okay, how do I solve this puzzle? Um, so that's helpful in a classroom where you may have students that English is not their first language. It's really difficult for them to grasp some of these concepts or have it um, explained to them where they have programs that are helping them along the way so they can stay up to date with their classmates. I'm thinking in terms of their one of my children's classrooms, there is a there is a child that their English is not is a really tricky for them and they're learning. Um, and each week when we get the seesaw notification, this child's on there as having solves like 200 puzzles. They're doing they're keeping up with their classmates. So I think that being able to have these iPads, although there are there are parts of it where you, you could argue that it takes socialization away from the kids and, and that they're stuck in, on the screen and it's too much screen time. I think there's a lot of useful things that come from having the iPads that I, I'm in, I personally am in support of, of every child having an iPad. Yeah. I'll go ahead, Rishesh. Oh, so, 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 thanks, Sally. So yeah, I, so that's a, so iPads are really good, especially when we have, when we what we uh, saw previously in pandemic, so that's how uh, that the technology gave us a leg up in quickly pivoting all our platform into the into uh, digital technologies and and reduce the impact uh, or mitigate the educational loss very quickly. So we, uh, there's uh, there's always a moderation that needs to happen, of of course, but but that also um, uh, that also prepares the kids into for the future generations, future technologies. They're not they're, they're not they're able to adopt the technology, and also they are able to learn um, beyond what they are just uh, being taught in the class. So uh, as Rachel said, uh, my kid loves ST math, so she jumps on the iPad as soon as she come back and does the ST math for <laughs> for for some time. Um, but we do have restrictions on the on the personal iPads, of course. But yeah, but, but there are also other other kids who may need time to really look and read in a um, little more time than actually that is allowed in the class. So it gives them the opportunity to catch up um, uh, for the slow readers like me. Um, so, the, so so that that's a that's a good opportunity. That's an equitable resource. I would see as it is a, as an equitable resource for everyone. To be on the on the same same uh, front in education, uh, in excellent providing that excellence in education. Thank you. So and I just I, want to clarify, Sandy. I want to definitely give you a chance to answer, oh, sorry, it. No. Yeah. and also for folks to circle back if they want to. But I think part of that question was, and, and I'm expanding on what I think he was trying to get at is, most of us who are working in the workplace are working on computer based technologies. We're not working on iPads. Does it make sense to be training the children to use the iPads when realistically that's not necessarily going to be a skill that they're going to need for their work life, for their for their professional development? I think that's what he was trying to get at and maybe putting words into his mouth, but that's kind of what I heard um, in conversing with him. So if you could touch on that, I think it would be helpful. Um, I think I can look at this from two perspectives because my children are the age where we didn't have iPads in school. So they went through Fisher Public Schools without that technology. I was part of the school committee when we voted to start implementing iPads. And that was a discussion. What was the best tool to use? iPads were chosen because of the educational apps that can be used on an iPad that aren't able to be used in a computer-based learning. And it, it was a lot of back and forth till we made that decision. And I think technology is, uh, it's a crucial, inter it's a crucial trend that we need to be part of in how educational services are delivered and how teachers deliver to a diverse group of students within the same classroom. And uh, it helps us better, edu uh, better communicate with our families. That's one of the big things that we're able to use iPads for, particularly with cultural and linguistically diverse families in ways that we weren't able to in the past. Um, and to me, the biggest thing, and the other candidates have mentioned it, it's equity. These tools have provided the ability for us to do personalized learning for students it's not, it, and it, it provides equal access to materials and books that some families can't afford, but we can on an iPad for free. And we can do that during the school year, but we can also use it during the summer. So there's a lot of 
tools on that little device that have made huge strides. And the biggest was we were able to pivot immediately to online learning. It wasn't the best thing for students, we know, but there were districts that had a hard time even getting that up and running. And that's the time where we brought it all the way down through the kindergarten level. I agree, definite pros and cons with technology. We all have iPhones or are always looking at them, maybe when we shouldn't from time to time. And I think an iPad is that same type of distraction, uh, lose focus when you have one, but it also really has enhanced learning and communication, but it's really has to be uh, co all of us working together, the schools along with the parents in the district, we're all in this together. and. When iPads came out, that was, I'll never forget, it was one of the calls, a friend of mine, my son is not going to be able to not be distracted with an iPad. And I think he's turned out fine. He graduated, he's went on to college, but that was a huge concern. And I know if it was my son, I would have felt the same way. Um, but I think we need to make sure we're always using the technology to amplify what we do, not to change per se. We want to use it for student learning. There still is a lot of pen and paper and pencil that's done. It's not all iPad learning, but uh, the use of an iPad just has more educational apps that are really relevant to learning versus computers. And a lot of students already have access to computers. And if they don't, our library has computers. So we hope that it's a combination of all of these things that are going to make them ready to go off to the next phase and into college. But um, it's, it's a very valid question for parents, definitely. Thanks. Um, Rachel and Raj, because I added that little twist to it at the end, I did want to give you an opportunity if you wanted to add anything else. Uh, no, I think that's a perfect thing. I still see the technology as a as a tool that enables um, and also provides that equitable. With the with the computers, yes, there is a need. There's a but still there is a, there is a technology need, right? So it's easily to transferable skills. I, I always pitch on that piece. So if you're comfortable using with iPad, it's the same thing. You're communicating with your computer and back and forth. So like I do that, I, I should not say, but, but I do that between PC and Apple. I do a lot of, I see that a lot of companies do uh, provide a PC at the office, but most of us own Apple products. So it's, it's not a one set rule that can drive us uh, or limit us. It's it's a accessible uh, and using it in a more meaningful way is what it matters. So that's I thank you. Um, I would say to you again, you know, having the iPads, we are able to access the apps that a computer can't. Um, I think back to when I was in school and we're probably all of the same age where we had typing class where they would just put you in front of a computer and cover your fingers and you would learn home row and um, and that was pretty much the extent of the computer training that we got in school. And I, I think that I'm pretty good with technology and iPads. So I'm not sure that using a computer would necessarily um, provide any more benefit. Um, I, you know, personally just through the different apps that I've now seen through K through five, just because that's what I've seen. Um, I think that there's a lot of benefit there. And um, I think that Sandy had said, you know, the communication is there too. So quickly can the, the teacher send something through one of the apps that they have that you can immediately see what your kid is doing in a classroom. Um, I just think the benefit is there more so with the iPads because of, of what the students and the teachers can access. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we had a hand raised, Carissa. Hi, thank you everyone for um, doing this and sharing your thoughts with us. Um, my question is, as a former teacher in a nearby town, I've seen firsthand how a school committee can directly impact the work environment of teachers, which we know directly impacts the quality of the learning environment for students. Could you speak to how you plan on hearing directly from teachers about what they need and the challenges they face and how you can support them? Sure. Um, I'll go. Um, I think the biggest thing that we do with our staff, it's very transparent. We reach out to staff for all of the questions that we have. They're always involved in any of the new initiatives, the planning, the rolling out, how how we work as a district is extremely collaborative and transparent. 
with parents, staff, students as well. And the other way that we work with our teachers is in our negotiations with them. We have an excellent um, reputation as a school committee with our union staff, and we have a great working relationship. Do we always agree? Absolutely not. I mean, sometimes we're on either sides of an issue, but we always work to the best of the ability for students and staff to make sure we're paying teachers fairly, that we're supporting them with professional development and any tools that they need. So for me, it's it's ongoing collaboration and transparency and including them in every decision that we make because they're vitally important. They are the key to the success of this district. I totally, I totally agree that they are they are very crucial. They are the the pillars for the, for the, for the, they are the, kind of the the educators of kids, and then definitely um, I I see that uh, being on a committee, several committees, the uh, redistricting committee, DEI task force, uh, and, and 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 some other committees within the town. I see that how the how the school system communicates with the with the te- with the school uh, te- teaching teaching uh, body, and then get their feedback, um, uh, and and then put incorporated. I also been in the on the school committee meeting last week, and then the the how the the, the homework policy team uh, explicitly said how they would communicate with the teachers and provide request their feedback and from the different channels. So that sort of open, honest, transparent communications is always key because if they if they if the teachers feel they have a uh, they have the stake at the table or in in the in the process, they this feel that they own it. They 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 are more they felt more uh, empowered and also responsible in in adapting those uh, policies. So I strongly feel and and believe in that um, having uh, having a um, uh, making sure that teachers uh, own that uh, uh, feel that responsibility and as they own it and then they enable all, uh, the, the the policies that that we bring in. So I'm very confident and aware we, we are very lucky in Sri Pedi with the with the teaching uh, staff that we have and, and the very dedicated uh, administrative staff and everything. So um, uh, kudos to them too. Yeah, I will echo um, what Rajesh and um, Sandy said that we we are so lucky to have these the teachers and the staff um, that we do in our schools um, being on different committees that it's not just parents um, that are asked to be on these committees. There are teachers, there are paraprofessionals, there are administrators. Um, you you have a really nice cross-section that they're involved um, and their voices really do matter. Um, this isn't you know the school committee or the district leadership coming down and saying, this is what the policy is and this is what's changing and you're just going to have to like, like it. Um, everybody's opinion is valued and they really talk things out and see the pros and cons of everything. Um, um, so I think the communication is key, that the teachers feel that they're part of the community. I think also building community within each of the buildings, too, so the teachers feel that they are part of the community when they're at work, that they feel they're part of the school, that they feel comfortable when there's a problem in their classroom, if there's a problem with a parent, if there's a problem anywhere, that they're able to go to the leaders in the building to voice um their frustrations, that it can be worked on within the building. Um, I think that um having been in the schools and talking with teachers they they like being a part of the solution um and not just going along with whatever is 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 told that, to them and i think giving them um during their professional development giving them the tools to success and the ability to to make a difference is huge thank you um and now this question for the housing authority candidates um do you believe that the application process for uh, access to the housing that's managed by the housing authority is equitable? And if not, is there are there things that you think we could do, whether it's at a state level or local level, to make the process more accessible? Um, the process is different. I, I talked about this a little bit last time um, for state and for the federal. For the federal. People come in, they fill out a paper application, um, they submit it and they go on a list. And then the next person, whenever there's a vacancy, the next person in line is called um, and offered housing. So 
it's I think I think it's I think it is equitable because it's a kind of a first come first serve as needed. Um, so I think that's good, and that's how we run it. And it's not run by favors or anything else. It's you know it's it's equitable. I think the state was worried that it might not be, and that's why they developed Champ. So it yes, is it equitable? Sure, um, because it's every single vacancy they pull twenty five applications. They're mailed out um, if. They don't get responses and they pull 25 more applications and mail them out. And there is a priority system with the state. So, for example, if you're homeless, you go to the top of the list. Um, so I think it's equitable. I think it's cumbersome. That's my bigger problem. It's, you know, it's and it is it could be overwhelming for people to try to navigate that if you don't have a computer then how do you log on to a computer-based application process? So, you know, that's a little bit tricky, but um, do I think the actual selection process is, is equitable? Yes. Yeah, I think we were trying to get more to the, the what you touched on briefly there about the, if you don't have a computer, if you're not aware of the resources mm -hmm. that are available, um, and you did touch on those things, so thank you for addressing them. Um, the, and this also, question is also for housing authority candidates. Um, because housing authority is not something that touches the lives of Sh most Shrewsbury residents on a day to day um, basis, the way, let's say, school committee or board, the select board might. What, in your opinion, what qualities would you say, having served on the um, housing authority and, and as a candidate for housing authority, would you say are most important for a candidate for housing authority to have? I think. Um... Compassion for our residents too. I mean, we're residents based. That's all our policies are made based on what's best for our residents. So I think someone who has the ability to, um, you know, care about the, our population, which is elderly and young and disabled. But also the other thing that we do is we we set policy and we manage the budget. So a financial background is helpful as well. I served on the finance committee at our real estate association and that helped prime me for managing a, a, a rather large budget. But I think it's kind of the combination of both the fiscal responsibility as well as caring about our residents. Thank you so much. Okay, um, we have about seven minutes left on the call. I would like to call one last call for questions from the floor. If not, we have a final question that we can ask on our end. I have okay. a question I can ask for you, but I don't want to take up all the time. So either way. Oh, no, please do. I, I'm not clear who just- Oh, sorry, that. it was me, Ashley. Ashley, okay, feel free, please. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Um, so my question is, um, again, about accessibility. Uh, Beale is the new Beale is the only elementary school whose playground has accessible flooring. Um, and none of the playgrounds are fully fenced nor particularly well equipped with accessible structures. Uh, so students with physical disabilities, as well as students who need an enclosed area for safety reasons can end up being excluded from the playground. Uh, there are also many well documented accessibility issues inside all of the school buildings. Uh, so my question is, do you believe that accessibility should be a priority for the district? And if so, how would you look to address those concerns? Um, I'll, I'll go. Um, yes, accessibility is is absolutely um, an issue and it's a priority. Um, I'll, I'm just going to touch on the playground for right now and then I can move on to the actual schools. So um, something that um, is related but stemmed from elsewhere is that um, on the PTOs, you know, one of the um, one of the things that fall under our purview is is paying for fixes to our playgrounds, um, and that can be um, who very expensive. I mean, replacing a little structure could be thousands of dollars, and because PTOs are mostly based off of we fundraise, um, and a lot of our fundraising gets used to pay for. Um, things that are not included in the budget. So for most of the PTOs, we pay, we help pay for um, scholastic magazines in the classrooms. We help pay, offset the cost of field trips. A lot of what we do is, is offsetting the cost to families. So that in a, in a given year amounts to thousands of dollars. Um, so then on top of that, having to pay for structures on a playground is very expensive. So something that we were talking about before is, is there a way that we could, because a lot of these playgrounds are shared spaces, is this something that we could look at with the town on combining our forces together to fix these? So um, something was brought up is having a um, someone come out and look at all of the playgrounds, not just at the schools, but across the, the town to see 
where do they need fixes? And that could include, you know, just structural pieces of it, but is it accessible? Can we get kids onto the playgrounds? Is it safe for kids to be on these? Um, so that is a priority. Um, and I know that there is talk right now of getting people out to review all of the playgrounds, but um, that is important. And I think that is something that is, is being discussed. Um, what was the second, the second part of your question was about the schools being accessible? Yeah, I mean, my main point is the playgrounds, um, which yeah. of course I, my expectation would not be that the PTOs would be paying to make the playgrounds accessible. Sure. Um, but, and then, yeah, I mean, there's just, there's also issues within the schools and all of that is part of that ADA transition plan self-evaluation that we already completed. So we do have information on all the accessibility shortcomings of those spaces. Sure. No, but I mean, just to, to close up, I, I think it is absolutely um, a priority. I think it would be priority for all of us um, to make sure that our schools and our playgrounds are all safe for, for all the kids that are on them. And I agree 100%. It's definitely a, accessibility is always a priority. And as similar to the question for the select board, we have to look at priorities within the priorities almost. You have to see what are the, what, what needs them most help first and then uh, look at funding models around that. So it's definitely an area that we have a report. We know where there are issues. I think back, it's probably 10, 12 years ago when the uh, Patton playground was replaced. That used to be an, a wood structure and there was some private funding. There was PTO funding. It was a, a fundraiser at that time to get that built, which is now probably out of sync with current uh, rules around playgrounds. So it, it's definitely a priority, but it's also a process that has to be looked at carefully within um, how it can be done, when it should be done in the funding model for it. But I know there's been a lot of private fundraising in other districts for these same types of issues. So I think it's a combination of a few things that would have to be looked at. I mean, one, one other thing I think I'll, I would like to add, I think there's a one, then there's one application from DPW to to do a comprehensive analysis of all the state uh, townwide playgrounds for the CPC committee. Um, so, so coalition for preservation uh, committee. So I think that's a one application that uh, that has been uh, put forward, and then um, I think we're going to town um, uh, town meeting to get approved to do that analysis, that initial analysis on the conditions of the town wide parks, playgrounds, mostly playgrounds, especially the ones that are very, very niche in the, in the communities and, and, and others. And then accessibility uh, also comes along with it. I think that we need to also focus that. That's a good, very good question. Um, so Bill being new, I, it gets to the, uh, to the more recent standards, but we also need to look at that like comprehensively across the school district where we stand on that and what are the priorities, especially um, where this needs to be addressed um, with more, more immediate uh, attention and then where we can put them uh, um, in, in a pipeline for future, future uh, attention. So that, that, that would give us a good understanding on entire um, infrastructure and the prioritization based on the need-based need prioritization and so that we can really um, utilize our funds more, more meaning, uh, more uh, so to be, get maximum uh, out of the out of every investment we put in because of the taxpayers. We don't want to burden the taxpayers. So, so also, we cognizant of that, um, that, that too. But I, I, I definitely agree, and, and that's a good question. Thank you. Thank you all for for your thoughtfulness and and answering the questions. As always, we wish that these forums could go on for even longer so that we'd have more time to uh, ask you guys more questions. Um, in that light, we'd love for you to put your contact information in the chat um, that's available um, in the Zoom so that any participants who may have additional questions for you can reach out to you there and so that we can also share it in a better shoes race so that participants who may be viewing this afterwards and, and want to reach out with a question have an opportunity to do so. Thank you all again for your availability today on a Sunday afternoon um, to participate in this forum. And we will look forward to the election on May 2nd. Thank you so much.